Hey, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Josh Epstein. I'm the marketing specialist for the TDA Perks program. Welcome to today's webinar, uh, HIPAA Compliance, Simplified Using Technology to Your Advantage. Our presenter today is Mr. Don Douglas, who is the Chief Operating Officer with Perks Partner i Connect. And Don is an expert on HIPAA Compliance, Communications, and Technology, and he speaks at both regional and dental and national dental meetings. And I want to add that Perks endorses i Connect for two services, uh, HIPAA compliant email solutions and ONC certified practice management software. I'd also like to add that i Connect uh, supports the Perks program and TDA, TDA through annual session meeting sponsorships. Every year they do study clubs, component events, so we really appreciate their support. Um, as you know, Perks is a TDA member benefit, so we've got over 25 additional vendors, all designed to help your practice, just like i -Corps Connect. Um, also want to make sure that we everyone knows that we open enrollment for the TDA Executive Management Program is now underway. So this is an eight-day executive development program designed to enrich the business acumen of TDA members. It's a collaboration between the Perks Program, TDA, and the University of Texas uh, at the Austin Combs School of Business. So definitely check back on that, and you can get with me. Um, I'll give you my information at the end of uh, today's presentation. Uh, the webinar is being recorded. Um, all of our webinars and articles are recorded or put in our resource section. Uh, for so You can refer to them uh, at your, on your own time. There will be questions uh, at the end. I'll be monitoring uh, the question box, you can type your questions in and we'll make sure Don gets them answered. Um, so, Don, ready to go? We are. Well, thanks, Josh. Okay. Uh, thanks for the opportunity. Uh, thank you to Texas Dental Association for the uh, opportunity to present. And uh, thank you to all the members uh, for taking your time to join us today. Uh, so, for the next uh, 30 or so minutes, uh, we're going to discuss HIPAA compliance and we're going to try and break that down into a uh, simplified manner and basically show you how not only can you protect your practice with technology, but if they at the same time also increase your productivity and your bottom line. So without further ado, we'll go ahead and get started. So so what is HIPAA? Go on here. So if you remember back in uh, 1996, the Health in Insurance Portability and Accountability Act was passed. And back in the inception of HIPAA, uh, HIPAA was actually designed to allow the employee, employee's insurance program to actually travel or follow with them. And so that's where the portability aspect of the health insurance or the HIPAA law came into effect. And then on the other side, uh, you as a provider were responsible for how you manage that, that information. And so um, that was back in 1996 during the Hillary Care uh, era where they were trying to pass that. And, it never did come to fruition, but uh, HIPAA is still around, and so basically a little bit of a time uh, timeline here. As we, again, passed in 1996, and then uh, it didn't really get any grip. Really, people didn't know exactly uh, what they were supposed to do. They knew the kind of the general idea, but there was really no rules of enforcement. And so then in 2003, they passed the privacy rule, and we'll go into those here a little more in depth here in a second. And then again, in 2005, they passed the security rule. And it wasn't until 2009 uh, that they actually transferred the enforcement of HIPAA over to the Office for Civil Rights. Again, no one's really enforcing it. And then it wasn't until 2013 that they actually started enforcing it because it had no money. So it wasn't until the omnibus bill was passed that they actually had funding to actually go out there and to enforce the law. And so we'll show you here, as, as you've seen since 2013, uh, the government has uh, vigorously started to uh, enforce HIPAA. So privacy rule, again, passed in 2003 and basically established the national standards on how to protect an individual's medical records or what we call protected health information. And so uh, that established a set of safeguards and requirements that you as a provider or what we call a covered entity had to follow in order to protect that information. And then thirdly, it also gave the patients full rights over their health information. And so there's a kind of a misconception in the industry, we get asked all the time, uh, who actually owns the health information? Is it the doctor who's, or the dentist who's purchased the software? 
enter the information, that maintains the information, or is it the patient? And so in 2003, they clarified that, and actually the patient actually owns that information and it has the right to dictate how that information is handled. Uh, so, but you as a provider, you actually are responsible for how you manage uh, that information. Now, in 2005, they passed the security rule because of the increase of email, texting, uh, electronic practice management systems or electronic health record systems. And so it basically uh, clarified on how to cover that information and, and protect it confidentiality, the integrity, as well as the availability. Again, it basically mirrors the privacy rule, but just deals strictly with the electronic transmissions. So when does uh, information become protected, or when does it become protected health information? And the simple rule there is that whenever I can uh, take a diagnostic or treatment information, and I can identify that to the patient, whether it be a name, phone number, date of birth, social security number, whatever the case is, when I can identify those two together, that's when it becomes protected. Now, another uh, core principle is that just because I work for the practice does not mean I necessarily should have access to that information. And so they created what's called the minimum necessary standard for access. And basically what that means is you need to restrict access of that information, that PHI, that protected health information, to only those that need it to perform their job. Or a simple way to say would be a need to know basis. And so how do you protect that information? So the, the HIPAA law basically covers a series of what we call safeguards. Now those safeguards are essentially broken down into three categories, administrative, physical, and technical. And that's what we'll probably co we'll concentrate uh, most on today. The administrative uh, covers more than 50% of the safeguards within the HIPAA law, and it deals with a lot of your policies, your procedures, your documentation, uh, your business associates agreement, uh, your notice of privacy practices, things of that nature. And then your physical, your physical deals with your equipment, your office equipment, your computers, uh, your environmental, the building, the structural, a lot of those things. So take, for example, um, let's take the equipment for example. Uh, every one of you probably here on the uh, webinar today probably utilize either a copier, a printer, a scanner, or a fax machine. And probably a lot of cases you're using a multifunction product that encompasses uh, all, all those products in one. And so, you know, traditional lifespan of a copier is three to five years. And what a lot of people don't realize is that that piece of equipment has a hard drive inside that unit. So every copy that you make, every scan, every fax that you receive, all that information is being stored on a hard drive. And so the typical scenario is about year four or five, that system starts breaking down every day. You've got the copier technician living in your office, and you can't wait to get rid of that piece of equipment and get the new piece in. And so we're so excited that the new equipment's arriving that we, we get that old piece of equipment out of there and be gone. But the way we don't realize is that that equipment is then taken, traditionally broken down for parts and spare parts, and sold. And so if I'm someone that's looking to acquire uh, social security numbers or medical records for devious purposes, that's probably where the first place I'm going to look. And what a lot of people don't realize is that a social security number will garner about 25 bucks on the black market, whereas a medical record can actually garner up to about $800 per record. And the purpose of that is, the reason for that is because not only do I have that one person's information, but a lot of times those records include a lot of their, their next of kin, the spouse, the children. So instead of getting one set of uh, information, social security number and so forth, I might be able to garner several. And so you wanna make sure that when that piece of equipment leaves that office, you wanna make sure that you've either acquired that hard drive, replaced it with a new one, um, or have that thing, uh, digit, what's called digitally shredded, um, but you wanna make sure that that information has been uh, captured or cleared before that uh, ever leaves your office. And so those are just some of the things you wanna think of there. Now again, next thing you want to be aware of when dealing with your safeguards, you're gonna hear two terms. You're gonna hear required and addressable. Now required, simple enough. 
you as a covered entity, you must implement a policy or procedure that meets the specification. There's no questions about it. If you haven't, for example, a risk analysis, if you've not had a risk analysis, I would highly encourage you uh, to reach out to the Texas Dental Association and uh, find out that they have a vendor, preferred vendor, who they utilize for this. This is something, that the first thing that an auditor, when they come in to do an audit, a compliance officer is going to ask for. They're going to ask for your risk analysis. And essentially, a risk analysis is someone's going to come in, take a look at all three different sets of safeguards, your administrative, your physical, and your technical, make sure that uh, everything is properly documented, the software is properly secure, uh, and then all the proper procedures are being followed. And then, and then the next one would be your business associates agreement. Please make sure that you are signing a BAA with everyone that you are transferring protected health information with, whether it be a third-party insurance company, a email provider, uh, whoever it might be, claims company. Make sure that you have all of your uh, uh, documentation in place. And then always, obviously you want to make sure that you're always backing this information up and have it stored. So addressable. Again, a uh, misconception of addressable means optional, and that's not the case. Addressable simply means that you have the flexibility on how you want to address that specification. Uh, you take, for an example, a hospital. A hospital may require to have a security guard protecting certain locations of that of that establishment, whereas in a one or two person practice, it may only require a locked door, some type of mechanism to prevent uh, people from going into areas they shouldn't go. So again, it has to be what's called reasonable and appropriate. All right, so the, the government does give you flexibility there. So addressable does not mean optional. You do have to meet that uh, safeguard. It just gives you flexibility on how you can do that. So technical safeguards, this is really where we kind of uh, specialize in. And if you've ever taken a look at uh, any type of government documentation, uh, it kind of reads like a tax code. It's very, uh, very difficult to understand. It doesn't make a lot of sense and uh, you, know, you just get frustrated trying to get through it all. So what we've done is we've kind of basically put down the five technical safeguards and also the administrative safeguard for when you want to transfer protected health information in an electronic manner. And we'll go through each one of these. The first is going to be transmission security. And the best way to, uh, to meet that standard is through encryption. And encryption can come in many different formats or uh, standards. It comes as 256, 1024, 2048. The key to understand here is that the higher the number, the higher the encryption level. And so I know that we use 2048-bit. It's the highest uh, in the industry today. Uh, in fact, uh, DigiCert, a third-party uh, security company, did a survey or a research paper and basically said that with today's computing technology, it would take approximately 6.4 quadrillion years to decipher a 2048-bit encrypted code. Now, I'm not exactly sure what quadrillion is, but I know that's a lot. So uh, make sure that you're always using the highest level of, of encryption. Now, another way that you can uh, secure that information is through utilizing a cloud-based platform. Uh, you know, a lot of people have a lot of misconceptions about the cloud. The cloud is very secure. The cloud simply means that that information is not resident upon your current desktop or your current servers within your environment. All this information is being stored in data centers, HIPAA compliant data centers all throughout the country. You'll see them to be redundant, meaning that if anything were ever to happen at one data center, all that information is being duplicated and stored in, du in multiple different locations, um, which is very secure. The next safeguard we'll talk about is authentication. Uh, you as a covered entity, are required to ensure that you know who you're transmitting that PHI to and from. Now, I would recommend the direct project. The direct project is the federally recognized protocol uh, for transmitting PHI uh, from provider to provider, provider to third party entities. And essentially, the direct uh, project requires the proofing of identity. 
They're going to verify your identity, and then they're going to register you with a certificate of registry. So that if you ever do come under uh, audit, uh, that information can be provided to the auditor, and they'll see that you're actually abiding by the standards of HIPAA. Access control. Who has access to your information? You're required to ensure that is uh, protected. And so uh, by either using unique identifiers, um, we actually utilize what's called an automatic log off. So that way, kind of like an online banking session, if you get up from your system today and you go to lunch or you go uh, take off this evening for the weekend, uh, if you're utilizing any type of uh, Gmail or Yahoo, those systems do not discontinue use. They do not log you off. So kind of like an online banking session where after a period of non-use, you want that system to automatically log you off. And so uh, that way the maintenance crew, the cleaning crew doesn't have access to your, your patient records uh, when you're not there. Audit controls is number three. So if you do ever come under audit, uh, one of the first things that the uh, compliance officer is going to request is one is going to requ uh, request your risk analysis. And secondly, they're going to want to see an audit trail. Where are you sending this information to? Who are you sending it to? What time? What date? And so they're going to want to know where that information is going. Now, the audit controls typically work behind the scenes. Um, I know within our product, we actually can provide that audit trail for you at just simply a request. But you want to make sure that you are controlling of who, to be able to determine or tell who that information was sent to and at what time. And then you also got to make sure that that information is being stored for a minimum of six years. And that ties us into integrity, the fifth technical safeguard. So you as a covered entity are required to implement policies and procedures to protect that information. And you also need to protect it from any type of alteration or destruction. So if you're utilizing any type of Gmail or Yahoo, uh, that account can be easily deleted and all that information is gone. Again, the law requires that information to be stored, unaltered, encrypted, at rest, for a minimum of six years. So again, how can I, how can I meet that safeguard? By simply uh, utilizing the offsite type of compliance server. Again, go to the cloud. You'll hear, hear me talk about that a lot. The cloud is very secure um, and it and takes a lot of the responsibility off of you of maintaining the data and security of your information. So how are you transferring your PHI. I know that if you're utilizing any type of a Gmail or Yahoo, uh, or what we call free mail, uh, nine times out of 10, they're not secure. Uh, if they have any encryption, it's a low level encryption at all. Uh, there's no audit trail, no access control or auto log off features, and no business associates agreement. So in essence, they're not HIPAA compliant. And unfortunately, we find that a lot of dentists still either, and believe it or not, uh, do not believe HIPAA is real, or they just don't believe it's going to happen to them. They're not going to get caught. And so um, you know, what you need to keep in mind, if you're sharing data through Yahoo or Gmail, any type of protected health information, that information is not being shared over a secured server. Uh, Yahoo and Gmail use what are called shared servers. So that means that anybody can log into those servers and can, uh, if they can obtain that information, can uh, read that uh, email or that protected health information, and it's not secure. So uh, don't confuse uh, secure products or secure email products that will advertise as being HIPAA compliant because they're encrypted. That, that does meet a HIPAA requirement, but it doesn't make them fully HIPAA compliant. So make sure that... Uh, Whoever you're utilizing, make sure they check off all five of the technical safeguards as well as storing that information for you for six years. Make sure they check off on all the boxes. Here's a good case in point. I always say make them prove it. Don't just let them tell you. Uh, you'll see here uh, just about a year or so ago, uh, the actual U.S. Federal Trade Commission actually fined Dentrix, Henry Schein, uh, fined them uh, for their Gentrix Dentrix G5 software, where they kind of misled their, uh, their customers on the encryption level of their software. So don't just take their word for it, make them 
show you. Because, guys, enforcement is not a myth. Uh, the former director of uh, the Office for Civil Rights, Leon Rodriguez, he basically said in 2013 that the addition of the funding and the changes in the law actually strengthened his ability to vigorously enforce the HIPAA privacy and security protections. And then right behind that was uh, the chief regional counsel. He had said that the monies that were collected the prior 12 months, which is about $10 million in HIPAA fines, would be low in comparison to what was coming. And he was right. Now, what happens if you do uh, have a breach? Well, if you have a breach of 500 plus uh, patients uh, or more, uh, there's a couple things that have to happen. One, you've got to go out and you have to notify all of your patients that you breached their information. And that usually requires you to actually advertise in the paper, uh, in some type of public notification, you have to let all of your patients know what has occurred. And then additionally, you have to notify the Department of uh, Health and Human Services. And so once they find out, uh, probably gonna, they're probably they may uh, convene an uh, audit, but they're definitely going to put you on what's called the wall of shame. And so uh, if you, I would encourage you to take a picture of this uh, link or copy this link down and go to it uh, when you have some free time. And it's basically a website that the uh, federal government posts of all the breaches uh, that have occurred, and it basically lists your practice, it lists why, and what you'll find is that the majority of the breaches in HIPAA today are caused by electronic, and the majority are through email. So I'd encourage you to go out and take a look at that uh, website. And keep in mind that uh, the law just recently changed within the last year that to file a complaint, I used to have to call and file the complaint. Now I can simply go online and file that complaint online. So um, you want to make sure that uh, you're following that law. It only takes one disgruntled uh, employee or one disgruntled patient. So the fines and penalties, uh, they can range anywhere from $100 all the way up to uh, $50,000 per page, up to $1.5 million within a year, so per incident per year. And because they're tiered, that means they're accumulative. That means that if I break into your email and I find five records, uh, five emails with protected health information, that means that can be five times the penalty. So it was 50,000 per page times five, you do the math. And again, it doesn't matter because you didn't know, uh, they can still fine you. But if they know that you willfully and neglectfully uh, broke the law, then that obviously uh, increases the penalties. And so here's a, here's a quick little graph here, a little chart. You can see after 2013, the fines uh, dramatically increased. Uh, we did see them doubling for the first couple of years. And then here in 2017, you started to see them drop off. And if uh, 2018 goes uh, as well as did the first six months, you'll see another drop off there. And we believe that's due to people actually becoming educated, people like yourself taking the time to learn about HIPAA, and actually then taking action to uh, protect the practice and protect the records. Keep in mind too, gang, that uh, the penalties can be criminal. Uh, so whether you didn't realize it or you did something uh, to, to gain personally or to be malicious, uh, that, that jail time can range anyway from one year up to 10 years. Now again, guys, I'd encourage you, if you have any questions during the presentation, please feel free to uh, go to that question box, enter that, and then uh, obviously at the end of the presentation, we will address those questions for you. So, so that's the law. How do we utilize the technology to increase our productivity? Well, you've got two choices. you either currently on the server or the cloud. And so let's talk about some of the, the problems and some of the benefits of the, of the two. So the first problem is that server-based systems are, are expensive. Unless you take special provisions, they're not secure. They require a large initial cash outlay. Uh, think about it. You went out, you researched your software. You probably spent anywhere from thirty dollars to $50,000 to purchase the software. Then you went out and you spent probably another $10,000, $15,000 in computer hardware, uh, desktop monitors, uh, and now servers all of your software is to make it all work together. 
And then every two to three years, uh, it's time to do an upgrade. And so you go out, you have to purchase the new software. That's another ten, fifteen thousand dollars $15,000. And then, by the way, that new software requires better computing power. So guess what? Now we have to update our, our hardware again. So you can see where that, that perpetual, uh, continual uh, outlay of large cash investment time after time. And then you got to have somebody to hook it up. So you either if you don't have IT staff on board, you've got to go out and then bring that staff in to to, uh, to, to manage it. So as you can see here, it's very expensive. Um, again, the time from the time you buy that software and install it, that software becomes uh, you know old as new things come out. So here's a comparison with the cloud. So you know currently if you have to uh, manage that server on premise. You got to have somebody to make sure that you're keeping up with all the security. Whereas with the cloud, that's all taken care of for you. Cost again, large initial cash outlay for software and hardware. Whereas with a cloud-based system, it's simply a SaaS model or software as a service, which usually requires just a monthly a monthly subscription uh, and doesn't cost you every time that they you need to upgrade. So there's no uh, upgrades needed. Every time that you turn that software on, the, the newest and latest and greatest software is always available to you. Again, maintenance. If you've got that information, that hardware, that equipment on staff or on site, you've got to have somebody maintain that for you. Again, when you're in the cloud, that is all handled for you behind the scenes. And then we talked a little about agility. Uh, you, you know, we call lock-in. Once you purchase that software, Anything that comes out after that requires you to go out and do another upgrade. So you're kind of locked in. So you want to get your money's worth for that initial twenty, thirty thousand dollars you just spent. You want to be able to get the productivity out of that, get a little bit of return on your investment. And so now you've got to stay in that same software for the next two, three, four, five years while new technology is coming out. So again, with cloud-based systems, uh, I know for example our system we do what's called a sprint every four to six weeks. So we're releasing new updates every four to six weeks, allowing our customers to stay in the most updated uh, technological advanced software in the marketplace today. And then last is mobility. Again, if you have all your hardware and software in one resident server location, you're kind of restricted to that, that location. So if, you, if you're away from the office, you have to go back to review that x-ray, or you have to go back and review that record. Whereas if you're dialed into the, uh, if you log into the cloud, uh, that information is accessible at 24 hours a day, seven days a week, as long as you have access to the internet. So the next problem we see with server-based systems is a lack of integration. Uh, we see a lot of people that are currently using server-based systems and they want to utilize the technology of the future as far as like e-subscription, electronic claims, and that requires them to sign on to a third-party system. And so what happens there is they end up having to do the work twice. So for example, e-prescription, they go to that third party module, they process the e-prescription, they have to print out that information and then go back and enter that into their practice management system at a later time. So again, essentially doing the same job twice. So the lack of integration. And the third problem we see is with security. Again, if that server's on site, you're responsible for ensuring that that information secure. You're, you're responsible for making sure that information is backed up on a very regular basis, a daily backup. Um, and so, you, you know, so you run into the issue of, again, everything falls on you. So, server cloud. I threw the slide in here because it's kind of like you've heard the adage, if I, if I want to drink some milk, do I go buy the cow or do I just go pick up the milk? And so, at the end of the day, what we really want is we just want the milk, right? So do I want to invest in hardware and software every three to five years, or do what I really want is the information that the software provides, uh, productivity, uh, reports, uh, analytics, um, the, the productivity of e-prescription and claims. So uh, you know, you gotta make that choice. Again, do I want to invest in equipment, or do I want to invest in the information that it provides? And so, You'll see here that the, as of 2015, only about 37% of the software programs in the marketplace were in the cloud. And the fact is, is that you're probably already in the cloud, whether you realize it or not. If you're using any type of uh, 
uh, QuickBooks online, uh, if you're using non-secure email products like Gmail or Yahoo, you're in the cloud. And so we see that uh, by year 2020, about 80% of the software products in the marketplace will be in the cloud. Again, so what are some of the advantages? Again, I have access to that information 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year with almost a 100% availability. The government doesn't allow you to say 100% because there could be that rare instance where you don't. But I mean, you can rest assured that if I can get access to the internet, I can access that information anytime, anywhere. And again, it's fully hosted and managed off-site. You don't have to worry about that. That means you don't have to worry about the IT support cost. You don't have to worry about keeping somebody on staff or trying to uh, get that IT support company to come in and help you out when needed. Again, they take care of all that for you. And then no capital investment or costly update. Again, everything is continually being updated every four to six weeks, every four to eight weeks. You're always in the latest and greatest technology. And again, no expensive data backup costs. So no additional server costs for additional storage. Um, you know, that gets, that gets costly. And then, you know, we talk about uh, work-life balance, freedom from the office. You know, what, what's the benefit of you being able to go on that vacation? And, and if you have to, if you do have to review an x-ray or do you have to review a record, what's the, the beautiful thing about being able to just dial into or log into the internet and view that information remotely from, from your vacation, from the golf course, on your smartphone, whatever the case may be. You know, your office manager, she's sick. Uh, she can't make it into the office. Well, how nice would it be for her to be able just to log in right there from home and be able to continue doing her, her duties? And so integration. Integration is really key um, to technology and the productivity and, and, effect, and affecting that, that bottom line. You know, uh, you take e-prescription. Uh, not only can these integration modules be beneficial and productive, but they can also be a benefit to your customer. So take e-prescription. The big thing in the marketplace today or in the news is the opioid abuse, right? So uh, the ability to transmit that information electronically, it's going to prevent uh, clerical errors in writing. It's going to uh, help the first fill adherence to make sure that your patients are taking the medicine. And so those are great benefits. Uh, the benefit to you as, as, a, as a, pro a provider. But what, what's the benefit to the customer or to the patient, the customer? Uh, the benefit is that normally they take that paper prescription, they drive to the pharmacy, they have to drop that prescription off, and now they've got to go do something for the next 30, 45 minutes while they wait for the prescription to be filled. How nice would it be for that patient to leave your office, drive straight to the pharmacy, and, and have that prescription ready, right? So again, uh, the integration modules they all tie into your practice management system. So allowing all of that information to be resident in one software program, one single sign-in, one single sign-off at the end of the day. For, uh, you know, processing your merchant services as far as your payments, uh, your claims, so, you know, HIPAA compliant email, patient reminders. Uh, they say that when you miss, a, uh, when the patient misses, misses their appointment, that on average it costs the provider about $300. So Having that patient reminder system integrated into the system, what a benefit. And then basically all this information allows you to provide analytics and your, and your reporting, allow you to run your practice more efficiently and more effectively. So if you're not currently in a cloud-based system, we highly encourage you to take a look. And what we think the solution is the cloud. We think one, you need to make sure that you're uh, looking at an ONC certified software program. ONC stands for the Office of National Coordinator. They do all the testing for the federal government to ensure that your uh, software meets the clinical security and interoperability measures for the federal government. So you want to make sure it's ONC certified. Again, we recommend moving to the cloud. Take all that head headache away of, of the uh, security and ensuring HIPAA compliance, the backup, the data storage, Take all that headache away, save, your, save that money from the IT cost, put that back into your practice, and let, the, and, let the, uh, and let your provider take care of that for you. And then make sure that software has immediate redundant keystroke. 
If anything ever goes down, every time that keystroke is hit, that information is automatically being backed up. And then make sure that your provider provides you flexible finance options. Uh, you know, there doesn't always have to be a large cash outlay. It could be a monthly, a monthly uh, payment. Um, you know, to be flexible, to allow you to, keep, again, keep that money in your practice, to allow you to put it to where you really need it. And then make sure that if you do move from the server to the cloud, make sure that, that, that your provider can take your current information and ensure that it's accurately uh, integrated or data migrated, if you will, into the new system. So basically, guys, you want to make sure that you're using technology to not only protect your practice, but to also increase your productivity as well as your bottom line. That pretty much is it for me today. Uh, Josh, if there's any questions, I would be happy to address those for you. Yeah, thank you, Don. That was really informative. Uh, I do have a couple questions here. And, you know, I think a lot of folks always get hung up on the, you know, technology aspect of everything. So it's a really good question. So how user-friendly is, like, is uh, iCore Connect Solutions? There, what's the type of learning curve that people are going to expect? Okay, so you take like our HIPAA compliant email, we can traditionally have uh, you up and running within 30 minutes from the time you sign up. Uh, we do an, a complete onboarding. We can upload your contacts information into our system. Uh, we can run you through. It's very simple. It's very intuitive. Looks like a lot of other email products. Uh, then you've got the i Dental, which is a little more, requires a little bit more training. I mean, it's a little bit more intensive uh, process, but we, we, from the day one, we start training uh, with uh, online videos and tutorials. And then actually when it's time to uh, do what's called a cutover, uh, we actually come on site. We actually sit there with the staff. Uh, we make sure all the data has been migrated properly. We do testing before we go live. And then again, we're there on site uh, with the staff there for the next uh, day, week, whatever's required to get them up and running. Great, and I, I got another question coming here from Dr. Sitters. Uh, I'm going to read it. Uh, so, if we switch to a cloud-based practice management system by law, uh, and we have to keep records for six years, when is it removed? Like, when do they remove all of the emails from Gmail from a Gmail account or an Outlook account? Well, see, that's the thing. Gmail is not HIPAA compliant. So, if you have that information there, I would I would find a way to migrate that data into a more secure uh, location. Um, but uh, Gmail, I don't know that they store that information for you for six years. So I don't know if I'm answering that question properly. Um, it, it, could I get some clarification maybe, Josh? Um, let's see. Dr. Sitters, do you I know, want to type out anything else? Okay. I know, um, I know Josh, that our for, system – go ahead, I'm sorry. Did you get that done? So they've only been no, open for four years. Okay. So that they've only been open for four years ago. Oh, I see what you're saying. So yeah, they so they're yeah, only they're, who, yeah whoever their provider is uh, for their email, they're the ones that are responsible for uh, um, maintaining that information for a minimum of six years. And then after six years, uh, that information just automatically just kind of drops off unless they want to retain that, and we can retain that for them. Okay, so actually, Dr. Sitters now uses uh, Office 365, and you know, Dr. Sitters, what I'm going to do is I'm going to get you personally connected uh, with Don, uh, so this way, you know, you guys can circle back and and make sure you're, you know, definitely comfortable with with everything here. And if you have any questions, it'd be a good way to just get, you know, get more information from Don. Um, yeah, you're welcome. And let's see another question coming in, in here. Uh, what's the difference, Tom, between a public and private domain? So okay, so a, yeah, we communicate with. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so a so a public domain is going to be like uh, a Gmail or a Yahoo, where anybody can tie in and send an email to each other. Uh, they can tie into that server, so anybody can log on to Gmail, create a Gmail account, and communicate with anybody through that uh, that server. A secured server would be something like the iCore Exchange. So that so when I transmit or when I actually email, say, from the iCore Exchange to a, another provider, I'm actually not actually transmitting any data across the internet. Actually, what I'm going to do is I'm going to send them a link. 
And so that link does not have any protected health information within the body of the email. They simply click that link, and that's going to log them into a HIPAA-compliant data center, which is ours, and then they're going to view the information. So we are essentially uploading that information to a secure server. We're sending the end user or the other person a link, and then they're clicking that link, and then they're logging into the same server where they can read that information at the same location. So the information on a secure, in our secure server is never being transmitted across the internet. And if you're not actually invited into our server, you cannot go in there and just log in and find our server out on the internet. Does that make sense? Yeah, definitely. Um, and, and you know, we got another question here as well, uh, just regarding, you know, PHI and you know why it's so targeted by data thieves out there. And you know, honestly, it, there's just so much at stake. So, uh, can you touch on that a little bit? Yeah, absolutely. So, again, you know, to if I obtain a social security number, I'm getting access to information from one person, and that's that. That's not good. Uh, but uh, out on the open market, thieves are only targeting, they're not targeting that because they get about 25 bucks per social security number on the black market. Whereas with a medical record, they can garner up to about $800 per medical record because, again, not only am I capturing the one person's information, but a lot of times in their records are the next of kin. It could be their brother, their sister, their children, their spouse. And so there's a lot more information that I can acquire through a medical record that I can't just do through a single a social security number. Got it. Yeah. I mean, it, it's, it's scary these days. I feel like there's just so many threats, whether it's you know, obviously with the practice or just on, on a personal, you know, we, we all have to be real careful. So actually this is kind of ties into that here, this next one. Um, so, so how does phishing work, Don? How, how, like explain okay. that. So how does phishing work? And basically, how does the i exchange fully protect users yeah. against the phishing attacks? So, that, so that's going to tie back into that two questions ago about how about the uh, these shared servers and the private server. Again, because we're a private network, a private server, unless I email you and give you a request to dial into my network, you cannot uh, send me an email by random. And that's what phishing is. Random Phishing is basically random emails that go out they hit your email account, you open it up, and then it releases viruses and different softwares inside your system. Uh, whereas the i Exchange is a private network. So if you don't have a direct extension, like a direct extension, you cannot email me within the i Exchange. Again, I have to initiate that conversation with a specific provider or a specific patient in order for them to communicate with me on the i Exchange. Uh, so, uh, so we're not we're not subject to any type of phishing um, type of software or type of email out there. Excellent. Um, okay, coming one question coming in now. So I, you basically, I know you touched on this, Don, um, but actually, I think it's really good to review. So tell us more about why it, you know cloud based is superior to server based. So let's make sure everyone uh, is is comfortable with that and understands that. Okay. So when a, again with the server based system, you're responsible for everything. You're responsible for securing that information. You're responsible for encrypting that hard drive. You're responsible to make sure that nobody steals those uh, those those uh, server computers. You know your um, your hard drives and stuff within the computer. You're responsible for everything. So. Instead of having that responsibility, why not go to a cloud-based data center that actually is extremely secure? They've got armed guards, uh, requires retinal scans, uh, uh, thumb, you know, fingerprint ID. I mean, they're manned 24 hours, seven days a week. Uh, so why deal with all that headache when I can let somebody else deal with that? Um, cloud-based is just superior. Again, it gives you flexibility. Of, of movement, so I don't always have to be at the office in order to review the information or to give a diagnostic or a diagnosis or a treatment. Um, just so many different, again, the cost, the cost alone to go out and continually purchase software and purchase hardware every three to five years, and they have to pay somebody to manage that on a daily basis. Why not turn that all over to a cloud-based system that takes care of everything for you? Again, 
I don't believe that dentists got into business to manage hardware and software. I believe they got into business to practice medicine and pre practice dentistry. So, um, you know, why have all that headache? Allow, um, allow yourself to go out and do what you got into business to do and leave all that headache behind. Okay, uh, let's see, I'm kind of looking through here. Okay, just to clarify, also, um, in the event of a HIPAA violation, is every single piece of PHI a separate violation? Absolutely. So the maximum Absolutely. fine and is applied to each piece of PHI? It can be. It just depends. Again, it's tiered. You know, did, you know they're going to come in and try to assess. Uh, did you know that you were breaking the law? Or, you know, on the other extreme is, did you know that you were breaking the law and you didn't care? You know, so they're going to, you know, it's going to be someone's personal opinion uh, of whether they thought you did or didn't. And quite frankly, I don't like leaving, you know, somebody might have had a bad day that day and, uh, you know, the compliance officer had a bad day and now he's going to take it out on me. So, um, again, yes, every piece of uh, protected health information can be an additional violation. So, again, we use the example of, if I broke into your email account and I found five emails that had protected health information on it, each one of those is a violation. They are cumulative. Excellent. Uh, you know, and you know, again, Don, we really appreciate the information. This is this is vital, critical um, stuff here. Um, and I'm just gonna. Any other questions, ladies and gentlemen? Let's see. I'm not seeing any come up here. Um, well, you know, ladies and gentlemen, for more information on i Connect, oh, actually, I just saw something come up here. I'm sorry. Uh, so my dentist is one of those old school dentists, okay? Uh, it's about five years away from retirement. Uh, he fights HIPAA. I'm the office manager. Am I subject to the fines or is he? Very good question. It's going to be the person that's handling that data. So if you are the office manager and you're the one transmitting that data, you're gonna the, the office manager is the one that's gonna be responsible, not the not the doctor. Now, everyone's gonna suffer because if that uh practice is, is fined, well then you know then then everyone's gonna suffer because uh that could be the elimination of that practice. I mean to you know not to have doom, you know, to spew doom here, but uh absolutely. The person transmitting that information would be the one responsible. However, everyone will suffer. Gary, um, and has i Exchange or i Dental ever been fished or hacked? I, I, I think you touched on that, but you know, why no, don't you explain a little never. bit more? Not okay. once. Okay. Not once. And, and Josh, we make sure that we stay up uh, in accordance with HIPAA. We stay up with the latest uh, technology. Again, our system's being monitored and upgraded every four to six weeks with any type of new technology that comes out to make sure we're staying on the front line. Yeah, and I mean, that's just one of the, you know, main benefits of uh, of i -Corps Connect, whether it's with the HIPAA compliant email or um, the certified practice management software. So, um, you know, we definitely trust in that. And, you know, ladies and gentlemen, what I'm going to do is we'll have this uh, recorded webinar sent to you. And I'm also going to get with Don and make sure uh, that he has your information and literally he can just answer your questions and just really follow up with you. Um, so if you didn't have a chance to ask any questions, uh, you can do that privately. So, Josh, know, let, me just, regards, let me just add this real quick, Josh. Ahead. Also, sure. if, if they sure, want, sure. Uh, we could also do a, a demo for each person on whichever product they would like to look at. They can simply go to the uh, to our website, and there is a uh, page there for the Texas Dental Association members, and they could schedule a demo on their time, whether it be in the morning, at lunch, after hours. We don't care. Uh, we can do a, a, a personal demonstration for them and answer any questions they have. Well, that, that's great, uh, and we appreciate you doing that. And again, you can also go to the TDA Perks website, uh, and you'll just look under programs. You can see the HIPAA compliant email or the uh, ONC certified practice management software. Um, I want you to know you can get in touch with me at any time, um, Josh Epstein, and my email is josh at tda.org. You can call here at any time, 512. 443 3675. And again, we're, we're all here to help. So, you know, we do uh, appreciate your taking time today and, you know, being with us on this webinar. And, Dom, we can't thank you enough for all you guys do and, and for spending the time with us. And, 
know, really a, a great uh, presentation. Um, so again, this webinar is going to be sent out. It's going to live on our site. So definitely, you know, uh, come back and and you know listen to it on on your own time. And we will have uh, Don get in touch with with everyone as well. And um, you know, again, we really appreciate your time and and being here with us. And obviously, we appreciate your being a TDA member. Um, so with that said, Don, did you have anything you wanted to add? No, nope, just uh, thanks to everybody for their for their time. Uh, I know they usually take their lunch break, so we appreciate it. That's right. All right, ladies and gentlemen. Well, we're going to close it down, and I just uh, want to wish everyone a happy, uh, a great, a great weekend. All right. Take care. Take care.